Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's another day at the Tonmeister Tagung in Cologne 2018. Um, I'd like to welcome you again to Sound and Recording Studio Szene. And we have a first guest for today. I'm very happy to introduce Roger Roschnik of uh, PSI Audio from Switzerland. He's the owner. And he's going to tell us about controlling phase and damping in monitor design. And Roger, I'll let you get to it. And I hope I can ask a couple of questions later. Enjoy. Welcome. Okay. Hello, hello everybody. Um, yes, so I think my presentation is going to be more about uh, monitoring in general. But as you'll see, uh, phase and damping is one of the most important aspects of it. So here you can see uh, the outline of the presentation. I'll go through a bit of what sound is, then I'll go over the loudspeaker technology, then the influence of the environment that's also very important in, uh, in monitoring. Um, so what is sound and sound quality? So sound, uh, I like starting these presentations with a bit of background information. So sound is just pressure going up and down, and they are mechanical waves that travel at 340 meters per second, and we can hear between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. So this you all know. But the wavelength goes then from 1.7 centimeters, that's very short, all the way up to 17 meters, that's, that's uh, the, the size of a house or something like this. Then what, what type of pressure are we talking about? Well, we measure the pressure in dB that we use in sound, but uh, normally we use Pascal, uh, and one atmospheric pressure is 100,000 Pascal. And here, 0 dB is 0 0.0002 Pascal, so it's a minute uh, difference in pressure. So 80 dB, that's a normally, normal listening uh, pressure, would be 0.2 pascals, and this corresponds to 0.02 millimeters water column, that is very, very small, and that corresponds to the atmospheric pressure you get over a difference of height of about two centimeters. So if you go up and down by two centimeters 50 times per second, you will hear a 50 hertz uh, sound at 80 dB because that's the variation of pressure you get. Anyway, all of these frequencies come from different places. If you hear sound from the left, from the right, from the top, from the bottom, they all blend up into one single pressure that goes up and down at your ear. And then we analyze that, or our brain will analyze this in terms of frequency, phase, and amplitude to tell what the sound is, where it comes from, and what its origin is. So it's an extremely complicated device we have between our ears capturing the information and our brain analyzing it. Anyway, what we don't like in all of these sounds is all the distortions that come with it. So distortions are sounds and things that are not in the sound but that we do perceive. So you have linear distortions that kind of uh, go over the full range of uh, frequencies or you have non-linear distortions that affect only certain frequencies. And then we have all the psychoacoustics. There's not only what we do receive, but there's the way we analyze all of these frequencies. Uh, things like masking effects, like visual effects, and your expectations. So just a few examples of distortions, much easier to put into picture when you see the actual picture. These are distortions that affect a certain portion of the picture, like these ones. This one will affect the whole picture. Um, there's lots of tools that exist to sort of uh, enhance uh, different types of distortions. But what's important to understand is in the recording, you normally have spatial and linear distortions. Then on storage of, of information, music, you don't have much distortions once it's stored. Reproduction, you can have some linear distortions. And in the loudspeakers themselves, you have linear, nonlinear, and spatial. And then the room brings also distortions that are linear and spatial. So what I'm trying to show in this, in this uh, slide is that many, many, most distortions that you will have in reproducing music come from the loudspeaker itself out of the whole chain. So this is all the physical side. And then there's the psychoacoustic side. Um, here's a, a slide I like to show because our brain will build a picture of the environment we're in based on what we can see what we can hear, what we can feel, what we can smell, but also our expectations. And here is a very good example because you can see the, the different color there are between A, a and B, and A looks much darker than B. But in fact, it isn't. If you draw a line through it here with the same color, you can see that it's the same color as A and the same color as B. 
But this is an example where our brain was going to build a picture of what it sees based on the fact that there's a checked board with black and white uh, squares and there's an object here that's casting a shade over the black and the white scale uh, squares so we expect the A to be much darker and we will perceive it, we will actually perceive it as darker than the B one, but it isn't in fact. Sound is exactly the same, we can hear things and then we perceive them very differently and I will show you here one effect that's quite interesting, the McGurk effect that I expect a lot of you have already seen, but listen to this carefully. Ba, 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 ba. So I expect most of you heard ba, 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 yes? Now listen to this. Ba, ba. Ba, 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 ba. Here, I expect most of you heard or perceived va, va, va. In fact, if you close your eyes and listen to it, you will hear exactly the same thing. Ba, the sound is exactly ba, the same. Ba, 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 ba. Now the second one. Ba, ba, ba. So this is kind of a very good illustration of how what we see affects the perception of what we hear. Now sound engineers try and put that aside and really focus on what they hear, but most people will, will use what they, what, they, uh, what they see to build the, the perception of what they hear. Um, now, so that's something to be aware, aware of, is what you see does affect what you hear. Now another example. Have a listen to this. Sounded strange, right? Have a listen again and see if you can get anything. Still strange. Now listen to this. I think Brexit is a really terrible idea. <laughs> Which I do. Um, so you heard some words there, right? Now listen to the first sound again. I'm just going to replay it. Yeah? So you can now hear words there. Once more for luck. Have a listen to this. Sorry, so this was an illustration to show that what you expect and what's already been preconditioned in your brain will help to understand what's coming later. Um, just a quick interruption. We didn't see the video, so if, you, if, if, if we had to see it other than just... Ah, you didn't see the video. No, no, no. Yeah, we yeah. All we see, unfortunately, is your presentation. Ah, okay, yeah, so you might yeah. have to switch over and maybe show again if you... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the second one wasn't that, that important to see it, but the first one was pretty important to see the, uh, to see the visuals. Um, yeah, th I think I'll continue with the presentation and we'll come back to it at the end maybe. But anyway, they're just very good illustrations that you can find on YouTube or any other channel. The McGurk effect on, that illustrates very well that what you see affects what you hear. Okay, uh, now I'll just go on to how we build loudspeakers and the effort we go into to make, uh, make good and accurate speakers. So what's the, what's the mission of an audio monitor? Well, it's to transform an electric signal that comes in here into an acoustic signal that's going to come out here. And we want to do this uh, as accurately as possible without adding anything or without taking anything else. So I explained before that... Uh, that sound was pressure and we have to create pressure by accelerating a membrane back and forth and this we do in the traditional way with an electro, uh, with a, a electro uh, acoustic um, membrane here. Um, you all know how this works but I just want to emphasize that it's quite a complicated mechanical device where there's many objects, many masses on springs, the membrane itself is on a spring of the surround, there's the spider, there's, uh, so it all has to be designed extremely uh, specifically and you have to be able to uh, quantify and manage all of the physical characteristics of this complicated device. So it's not easy. Uh, all the parameters can be described in what we call teal and small parameters, TSB. But the resonance frequency of the device, the mobile mass itself, that's, that you can, you can see here, well, I'm not too... Uh, then there's the... Then there's the um, the suspension that has its resonance frequency, there's the spider that's inside that has its frequ uh, resonance frequency, and all of these aspects have to be managed properly. Um, now, if you look at a, 
active speaker technology. So first of all, this is a speaker, closed speaker with one driver. Uh, wh what we mean by active is the amplifier that amplifies the signal is inside the object and perfectly adapted to the membrane it's driving. Uh, for us, I mean, in, in professional audio, we've been using active devices for at least 20, 25 years. And the great advantage is that it's all designed to work together. And, uh, and you can make a speaker quite a bit smaller with quite a bit of, of uh, pressure, sound pressure coming out of it. But anyway, the example I like to give is when you buy a motorbike or a car, the engine comes with it. It's perfectly adapted to what you're driving. It's adapted to the chassis, to the car. And you're not going to buy a chassis and then have an engine that comes trailing behind, 200 meters behind behind it, okay? The problem with this driver, as I said, it's a mechanical device that's quite complex and it works well at a certain frequency. So you can see here the SPL and the frequency and it's designed to work well at a certain frequency. Below that it won't be able to deliver enough SPL and above that it won't either. And this Q factor, or the, the, this is distortion, you can think of it like that. It's pretty low where the driver is very efficient, and below and above that, it has quite a bit of distortion. And then you have phase rotation, so you have a bit of phase rotation, we'll come back to phase rotation a bit f uh, further on, but you have phase rotation in a low frequency that's normal, that comes from this high pass mechanical filter here, and then it's flat. So this is quite a simple design but it's not perfect. You'd like to have a, a, a wider bandwidth here. You'd have to have less distortion also. <clears throat> so what can we do? Instead of having one driver, we can have another driver here. So we'll send the high frequencies to a small driver that's very, very good at reproducing the higher frequencies and we keep the bigger driver for the lower frequencies. Of course, you need a filter here that's going to add distortion in the crossover region and it's going to bring phase rotation. So this is not ideal at all uh, either but it does allow to go higher in frequencies. So then what the other system you can do is have an active, active crossover. So you, here you have one amplifier for each driver, perfectly adaptive to each driver, one for the high frequencies and one for the low frequencies. And this, with this you can reduce the distortion a lot in the crossover area, but you're still not perfect. Now you want, if you want to go low in frequency, one thing you can use in, a, in a, any speaker cabinet is instead of just using the energy that comes out of the front of the driver, you can also use the energy that comes out of the back and you can get this to resonate at a certain frequency in the cabinet and come out via port. So this acts exactly like a Helmholtz uh, resonator, but you want basically that what comes out of the tweeter, out of the woofer and the resonator and the port, all everything has to be perfectly flat in frequency and in phase. That's extremely important. But this works quite well. If you want to have a closed box, that's possible. But to reach the same SPL uh, in low frequencies, you need three times the surface. Pure physics, that's how it is. So if you want a closed cabinet, uh, you need three times the surface of drivers to get to the same SPL, same frequency as with a ported speaker. Lots of people don't like ported uh, cabinets because often what you'll have is you'll have a big bump in the low frequencies, then a hole, and then then the rest, of the, there's, there's no coherency from what, between what comes out of the driver and what comes out of the port. And this is, of course, not very, um, not very uh, comfortable to listen to. Um, then another thing is you get a lot of these distortions here, but this is basically all lots of resonance frequencies coming from the system itself in here. So here you want to control this. So the damping of all of this is extremely important. What we do is we have a, a feedback loop that measures the speed. Well, it doesn't measure, but it sort of it sort of takes the speed of the coil inside the magnet and feeds it back to the amplifier. And there's a there's an EQ in here, so it won't be the same at all frequencies. And it'll adapt the output impedance of the amplifier to dampen the movement of the membrane. So you should think of it as a real-time, very fast feedback loop that controls every single movement of the membrane and is perfectly adapted to the physical characteristics of the driver itself. You can see a bit more of the details up here in the schematics and you can see that you go through a, a, an EQ on this that is basically the reverse of the physical characteristics of the mechanical device of the speaker. So this allows to get rid of any type of coro coro correlate, uh, coloration sorry, that you would have on any driver. Um, okay, then we're We've got something quite decent in terms of frequency response and uh, distortions. Uh, now we still have to deal with the phase issue. Um, so here, it's, um, what we do is we compensate the, the phase so that it all comes out in line. So just a bit about, about phase. Um, 
Phase is extremely important. Lots of people think that phase is, is something that you don't hear. Of course, if you hear two different uh, sine waves at different phase and you move them back or forth, you won't hear, you'll just hear two sine waves. But in any impact or any transients, you're going to hear the phase uh, very easily. And the best example I can give is if you have a snare drum that goes ta, you have the high frequencies in the t and the low frequencies in the a. It's an illustration, of course, but you want to hear ta, and when you, you hit on your snare drum, all of these frequencies, many, many frequencies, will leave the, the drum at the same time and reach your ear at the same time. Unfortunately, if you go through any type of filter, and it can be electronic, acoustic, or mechanical, you will have a tendency to slow down the low frequencies and not the high frequencies. So if you input into a system with a filter ta, it'll come out to a. It's an exaggeration, of course, but it'll change the, f the timing between the high and the low frequencies. So it's very important, if you want to have accurate monitoring, to, to correct all of these phases and have them all, all together at the same time. Okay, so it's a question of having the same time between what comes here in the, electric, the electric signal and what comes out here. And the low frequencies, as we said, are going to be delayed a bit more in this system than the high frequencies. So you want to slow down the high frequencies and wait for the, uh, and wait for the low frequencies so that they all come out at the same time. How long do you accept to wait between here and here? Well, in sound engineering, you have to be quite fast. I mean, if you're listening to music like at home, you can just press play and wait one or two seconds. It's not a big deal. But when you're doing recording, when you're doing mixing, when you're doing post-production, it's extremely important that you get the uh, very small delay. So we normally consider that one millisecond is the acceptable, acceptable delay that you can have. Um, and we stick to something like 0.5 milliseconds. And that corresponds to the time it would take the sound to travel over about 25 centimeters. So the, the latency we have in the system is about the same as if you moved your head back by 25 centimeters. So that's acceptable. But more than that becomes complicated to start doing certain jobs who are like mixing and recording. So anyway, the question is you have to slow down all of the high frequencies to wait for the low frequencies up to a latency of about half a millisecond. And this allows us to correct the phase down to about 150 hertz. Now, we're sensitive to phase. We've just explained that. And it comes from the difference in the distance in, you have between the two ears. So you hear, one, you hear the sound with one phase coming to the right ear and another phase coming to the left ear. And this will give you a good sense of the impact and also the position in your stereo image where the sound is coming from. So you've got, you have about 20 centimeters between your ears. This means that for very high frequencies, you'll have several uh, cycles between one, and one ear and the other, so you won't be that sensitive to the phase. So there's no need or there's no real reason to correct the phase. In low frequencies, when you have a wavelength of 10 meters, the 20 centimeters between your ears will only re represent a few degrees of, of phase, and this you won't be able to perceive anymore. So traditionally, well, what we, it's normally accepted is that we're sensitive to, say, to phase between two, 300 hertz up to uh, 2,000, 3,000 3, hertz. And that's where phase, sort of all the mediums and high mids, that's where it's extremely important to have a, an accurate phase. So anyway, all this to say that the limits we have when we correct phase are latency, uh, and then ha uh, how far down in the frequency range can we actually hear these. Um, but anyway, you can, we do this with, um, sorry, we do this with uh, all-pass filters. Everything that's in here is analog. And I'll go through a bit more of that later. So we use all-pass filters that, that will affect the phase without affecting the frequency. And this is the result of one uh, all-pass filter. So you have to have a, a lot of them all lined up to be able to slow down these higher frequencies until they're all aligned with the lower frequencies that you're actually waiting for. Uh, in, our, this, in this model, we have something like 11 all-pass filters, all handmade and all, all positioned nicely. And in the bigger one, we have up to 14 all-pass filters. Anyway, the, the result of this phase compensation and this damping system allows you to come out with very, very good transients and, and stereo image. Okay, at the top here, we can see a phase, um, the, the phase coming out of a normal three-way system where you have quite a bit of phase rotation. Phase rotation means you're, you're, you're changing, you're changing the, the, the timing issue with the lower frequencies. And you can see there's quite a bit of phase rotation. In our system, what happens is from 150 uh, milliseconds onwards, we're completely flat. 
we're only sensitive to about plus or minus 10, 15 uh, degrees. So all of this is, you won't hear this at all. Uh, now, another illustration, if you, if you input into the electric signal a square wave that comes in, you don't have square waves in natural environments because you'd need an infinite amount of sine waves to fill up all of these, these corners. But you do have some quite, uh, quite sharp transients that you want to re reproduce properly. But anyway, what a normal speaker will do is it's going to start reproducing the high frequencies, then it's going to follow with the low frequencies, then it's going to stop the high frequencies, and then continue a bit longer with the low frequencies. And if you input a square signal like this into most speakers, it'll come out like the blue one in the middle. So what we do here is we wait half a millisecond, 0.6 milliseconds, and then all frequencies down to 150 hertz come out at the same time, and then you just have the, uh, the very low frequencies that have a bit of delay. So the, the impact is much, much cleaner and closer to the original signal. Um, I just go back to uh, the slide that we have here, just to explain that everything we do here, you can do either with digital technology or with analog technology. So what are the advantages of digital and analog? Well, one of the advantages of digital technology is you can memorize information extremely easily, much easier than on, on tapes or on vinyls. Um, and it also allows you to process information very quickly and be very flexible if you have things that are changing. You can process information. Um, here, but for the lifetime of your, your speaker, that's going to be quite a long time because there's not much evolution in speakers, but for the lifetime of your speaker, there's a transfer function between what comes in and what comes out that's not going to change during the, during the time. So you might as well do, put all of this into analog technology and you, you're not going to memorize information, you're not going to process information that's changing, so you can do all this in analog technology. Analog technology has the advantage of being fast, not chopping up the signal, perfectly linear, um, and, uh, and not requiring a double conversion into digital and back into analog inside the speaker. Lots of sound engineers are very um, uh, put in a lot of effort in choosing their digital analog converter. They don't want their signal transferred back into digital and back into analog just because it's simple to make SP, uh, DSP filters in it. So we've decided to stick to analog technology. We keep an eye on all the digital, the way digital uh, DSPs are evolving. But uh, for the moment, we stick to this. The only problems with analog technology is all of these filters, you have to do them with physical components, uh, capacitors, resistors, and you have to have a print that's extremely smart, so you minimize the amount of components, you have the errors that, that correct each other, and then you have to have a very tight control of every single component that goes on the print. And those, that's, what's, that's what's complicated with analog technology. Uh, but anyway, that's what we do. Um, <clears throat> I'll come in here, yeah. Okay, um, just here, so what I said a bit before is this is our three-way speaker where you have tweeter, medium, uh, bass, and then the, the port, and all of these have to be uh, lined up properly so that the sum of all of them is totally flat in phase and in frequency. So you need, so where you position these crossover filters, huh? Uh, uh, is, is very important, the slope, and you have to use the natural, there's not only the crossover electronic filter, there's the natural filter of the device, the driver itself, that you have to use. So basically, it's, you have to fine tune all of these, all of these drivers and the filters so that the, the sum of all of, all of them is, is flat in frequency and in phase. Anyway, this is what it looks like uh, on a schematic. This is what it looks like in real life. So basically, here we have the woofer plus the port. Here we have the uh, mid, here we have the high frequency. But the, the sum of all three has to be perfectly flat in frequency, sorry, and in phase here. And that's a lot of the fine tuning in a speaker is getting all of this right and properly right in time. But it's extremely important. And remember, it's not just putting an electronic filter. It's using the electronic, it's, it's using the natural filter of the driver of the cabinet and then complementing that with an electronic filter so it all fits together. Directivity is very important also. Uh, so here you can see sort of the directivity you can have out of normal instruments. And what you can see is the higher the instrument goes, the more direct the sound is. And then the, in the low frequencies, if you have an organ, it's, it's very omnidirectional. But there's a, basic, a natural uh, tendency 
uh, of all, for all our instruments to be more directive in the high frequencies and less directive in the low frequencies. And what we try to do is, is reproduce natural sound, so we have also a directivity that corresponds as close as possible to the directivity of all of these uh, speakers. We don't want to be too directive, we don't want to be too uh, omnidirectional, but you want to be pretty directive in the high frequencies and pretty omnidirectional in the low frequencies. This is what we try and do. Um, here is, uh, well, the specs of one of our three-way speakers, where you can see all of these things, like directivity, frequency response, phase response. Uh, when, if you do choose a speaker, do look at all of these specs. They're ex extremely important uh, to make sure that it's done properly, because as we showed before, your brain can trick you into, into preferring something that you've seen or something else to do, as a sound engineer anyway. Focus on what you're going to hear, and just look at all the technical data that's available for a start. Then, once you've done your homework on that, then you can choose whatever you like, but at least do that. Uh, what we like to say also is when you do listen to, when you do A-B testing out of a speaker, well, you should remember that your auditory memory only lasts for 10 to 15 seconds. You can focus on certain points, but it's very important to do quite quick A-B testing if you really want to. When you do A-B testing, the position of the speaker in the room is also extremely very, very important. So if you test a speaker here and a speaker there, the difference between those two is probably very, very important. So, don't, so if you do have a preference to one or the other, it's very important to sw switch them around and see if that pre preference is still the same. Very important to do blind testing, otherwise you're going to focus on what you, what you see and uh, more than what you hear. And most people that come and test speakers, they're going to come in with their favorite song that they've listened to 10,000 times on their, on their old stereo at home. What we say, well, be critical. Listen to things that are critical. If you listen to white noise or pink noise, uh, things like clapping, you can hear, you can hear it very distinctly and you, could, you can pick up the differences in tonality between one speaker and another so much easier with pink noise, white noise or clapping than with your favorite song. Um, so yeah, avoid all these emotional samples and all this and be critical when you do all of this. Okay. Um, now, I'd also like to just, because as I just said, the, the, uh, the speaker is one thing. It allows you to have a, a very accurate uh, direct sound and this allows you to identify the source of the sound, whether it's a person talking, whether it's an instrument, whether it's a branch breaking, but then the whole environment you're in will give reflections that give you information on where you are in, in, in what type of room. So I'll just illustrate that by, by this. So everything I've said will give you a direct sound here that's as accurate as possible so that you can identify the source of the sound very accurately. But what you're going to be hearing and what, you're going to be, what your brain is going to be analyzing is the sum of this plus all of the rest. So you have the early reflections, the first reflections that give you from the first walls, that give you a sense of environment of the room you're in, and you have all the reverb, the echo that's sort of lingering on, going on and off. So you, it's quite easy to understand that, that if all of these reflections are too high compared to the direct sound, it's going to change your image a little bit and it's going to give you false information. So it's very important to have, first of all, all these early reflections being as low as possible compared to the direct sound, and that means you need a bit of damping and good, good, uh, good treatment in your room. And it's also very important that all of these bars here of the reflection don't all add up in one single place. If you've got a cubic room, you, instead of having one, two, three first reflections, you'll probably have them all at the same time and then all add up and end up higher than the direct sound. So this is also something you want to avoid. So this is in designing your room. If you're lucky enough to start from scratch, you can probably think of the dimensions so you don't have too many of these problems. Okay, so just again here, the direct sound gives you information on the source of the sound and it has to be as accurate as possible. The indirect sound gives you information on the surrounding you're on and ideally you do not want to change the direct sound just to correct the environment because it's going to change the direct sound. You want to, ideally you want very accurate direct sound and a good room that's balanced. Okay, and you don't want to uh, so you don't want to correct the direct sound just because your room is not, has problems in some frequencies. If you have a nice piano in a room and that one of the, one of the keys lands on a room mode, you do not want to take that key away just because it's a problem in your room. You want to correct your room. Anyway, 
uh, the indirect sound, just a few words on this, because afterwards I'll be, tomorrow I'll be giving a, a speech more on room mode. But anyway, the indirect sound enables you to apprehend the environment you're in. It's the sum of all of these reflections. And the most important um, factor or element that we can, we can assess in this is the RT60. And this is the time it takes for the echoing sound to be reduced by 60 dB. It's the ringing time, and uh, we often call it RT60. And it can go quite high. Yeah? In a church, there's a lot of echo, and it can go up to 5 or 10 seconds. It's not a problem if there's a lot of echo in a church. The only thing is you have to adapt to the acoustic message that you're giving in the church to be slow enough. So you have to talk slowly, you have to have slow music, but it's, it works very well. If you're in a studio or somewhere smaller, you want to listen to fast music, all sorts of music, and you need the reverb time to go down much faster, and it's typically down to 0.2, 0.5 seconds. Okay? Um, the mastering, it could be a bit higher, but that's typically what you want. But it must be similar over all the frequencies. You do not want to have 0.2 seconds in the high frequencies and 5 seconds in the low frequencies because this happens so often because low frequencies are difficult to treat. People will over treat and over dampen the high frequencies and put insulation all over the place and their high frequencies are completely dead and the low frequencies keep on ringing for seconds. This in for your brain, it's very difficult to understand it because you think you're in, in the mountains in the high frequencies, in the snowy mountains in high frequencies, and in the church in the low frequencies. And it's extremely difficult to, to understand this. So this is just, just to tell you that reflections, if you don't want any reflections, if you want a flat frequency response while you're listening to a sweep, then you have to be in an anechoic chamber. In a, in a room, you have reflections and it gives you accidents or an uneven frequency response. Much more important than the frequency response in a room is the RT60. Okay, just one more, just one more uh, slide here. Uh, so this is the way it happens, how we measure it, and then there's the way we analyze all of these reflections. And this is the psychoacoustics that's extremely complicated to get a grasp out of. But what you have to understand is you, you have the first, you have the first uh, signal or the first uh, direct sound that comes. If, if there's a second sound that's just after it too close, you'll analyze it as one single sound and it'll change your shift a bit. Then there's everything that you, you, we call the Haas effect, which tends to, if, there's, if it comes a few milliseconds afterwards, you won't identify it as two sounds, but you'll identify it as one single sound coming from the position of the first sound. So when we do a sweep, when we measure and we have all these frequencies coming together, we try and get it flat, but our brain won't analyze it like that. It'll focus very much on the first signal as long as the first signal is louder than the other ones. Then you have the useful reflections and the re reverb. So I like to show this picture, but I also like to show the one on the bottom right here that shows that it's much more fuzzy than, than the way it's drawn up at the top. But what we have to understand is that the first, the first tenth of a second is a lot of things happen in our brain and the way we analyze this direct sound with all of the first reflections. Okay, so that's kind of, now I'd just like to, uh, uh, just present a little bit about our company. Uh, we've been making speakers for over 42, 43 years now. Uh, it, the, the company was founded by Alain Roux and his idea was that a speaker should transform an electric signal into an acoustic signal. And in those days, most speakers were made like violins where you listen to them and say, oh, I like the sound of this one, I like the sound of this one. But we always said, we're not the creative people, we should just reproduce whatever the artist and the sound engineer wanted to do. So we made passive speakers for a long time. We made PA speakers. We started manufacturing Rowan in 88. Then Studer came to us and we developed uh, active speakers for them that we manufactured until they were acquired by another American group. And then we relaunched our old brand, which we sell here. And we launched a couple of years ago the AVAA, that's a sound absorber that I'll be presenting tomorrow. This is where we we are, we love having visitors, so please come to see us in Yverdon. And uh, yeah, you use a lot of digital technology to, um, to, um, to modelize things and to, to, to develop things. Uh, what you should know is that acoustics is not like accounting, it's more like a weather forecast. You can have a model that's more or less right, and the more you learn, the more you can fine tune your model, but you have, to build, um, you have to build a model, then you build a prototype, and unfortunately the prototype is often very different from the model, and unfortunately the prototype is always right, not the model, so you have to go with that. Then we're a small company, so we do everything by hand. This is our tweeter manufacturing that we do. Uh, we also make seismographs that measure vibrations on bridges with the same uh, 
with the same reverse technology, I would say. Everything's analog, as I said. This is us on our, our prints, uh, all through through whole soldering, assembly, cleaning. Um, and if the role of a speaker is to transform an electric signal into an acoustic signal, well, it's good to check that. So you put it in a room that hasn't got any echo, you input an, an electric signal, and you measure the acoustic signal that you comes out. And you do this for every single speaker produced that has to be delivered with his, his calibration curve. Like any precision instrument, whether it's medical or, or a microphone, they normally come with a precision uh, uh, calibration and the proof of it. So this, yeah, as a result of this, well, we are definitely very proud of every single monitor that leaves our, uh, our company, and we have prestigious references all around the world. So I think this concludes my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much. Um, I very much enjoyed your presentation, and uh, it co goes way beyond my pay grade. Um, but I can't help but to ask you a couple of questions. So you, you, you well, actually, first of all, you're obviously very passionate about what you do. How did you personally get to, to, to be the owner in the loudspeaker business? Are you are you an engineer? F uh, first of um, all, well, that's that's quite a complex. That's a long. <laughs> that's a few different. Well, I trained as a mechanical engineer, and I specialized in thermodynamics and energy. Uh, and but I did my uh, diploma in in musical acoustics. So I've always had this as a hobby, and I've always liked this. And then I worked in lots of different fields uh, in between, including uh, quite a bit in, in energy and thermodynamics and uh, in big multinational companies. And anyway, I wanted to come back into a small company for the, for the second half of my career. And uh, Alain Roux, the founder, uh, was looking for somebody to take over this. And uh, it seemed to tick all the boxes. I've always been a musician. I've always been a big consumer of music. And What's I've always liked the... Mm, guitar. What's your answer? Guitar. Um, but uh, it's true that also when we were developing the acoustic absorber, the AVA, it's important to forget a little bit about all of the acoustic side where we analyze everything in terms of frequencies and just think of it in terms of energy. And how are we going to absorb the energy out of here? And I think the, this, the approach of energy is very important. The, the other thing is fluid dynamics. Acoustics is nothing else than fluid dynamics in the alternative world, so go back and forth. But the understanding fluid dynamics allows to understand quite a bit in acoustics, yeah. Wonderful. Um, you've kind of mentioned it that you, uh, it's not, not only PSI speakers, but you have a variety of brands and you also do custom uh, work, is what I understand. So do you ever have projects that bring together your your knowledge of the speaker and the room acoustics. Do you design rooms with speakers? Do you do uh, specific, especially, I'm asking actually right now because of the uh, exciting new field, at least for me, of 3D, 3D audio. Mm -hmm. um, and the pretty um, extensive design of well uh, set up speaker arrays for this new technology. Is this something you're into? Well, I mean, the, the fact that we manufacture in Switzerland means it's quite expensive and we have to stick to things that are quite standard. And so we like to just make speakers that do one single job and do it properly, like reproduce a, a, an acoustic signal out of an electric signal. So that's what we stick to and we try and calibrate them and we say that's done. Everything that goes uh, before that, uh, of course, we, we don't like to get involved in too much. But of course we do, because a lot of our, the, when, when a speaker sounds bad in a room, the first thing that's blamed is the speaker, of course, and not the room. <laughs> so we always have to come in and position them properly. And then of course we do a lot of uh, consulting. We're not really consulting, but we help people a lot with the AVAA, that's the, the, the electric bass trap. So that's, we do spend a lot of time helping people and we've tested them in different, we've, we've, we've installed some in boiler rooms, heat pump rooms. We've had three car manufacturers come to see us about this product. Uh, we've put them in, um, in, in flats that are built above the subway, the uh, underground in London. So all of these, of course, require, but we don't do it because there's enough good acousticians and good specialists around, so we don't really like to, but we have to a little bit to get our products well known and make sure people use them, yeah. All right, thank you very much. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed that you actually get to do anything in the beautiful envi environment that you work. I kind of take that you ride motorbikes, or was that just an example? Yeah, I do have a motorbike. Well, there you have it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, visiting us, both Rogers and uh, you out Thank there. you very much. And other, do you guys have any questions? Any in the audience? Okay, well, we'll be back at 2. 
um, with microphone modeling. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.